Hey, Goodland Church. I hope that you've had a great week. I'm excited to once again dive into the Gospel of Mark as we continue to work our way slowly um, through this Gospel. And really, it is the Gospel for what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So that's the question that we've been asking each time we gather. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian, to follow Jesus? And up until this point, we've seen um, a lot of teaching about Jesus. We've seen Jesus calling his first disciples. We've seen him um, doing some healing. Um, we've seen him declaring the kingdom of God is near and then demonstrating the power of that kingdom as it's played out. So the kingdom of God is near and when the kingdom comes near, it brings healing and restoration. We've seen that over and over again. Um, as Jesus is declaring um, the kingdom and embodying it in who he is. And most recently, over the last few weeks, we've been diving into chapter four and the parables of Jesus. And Mark gives us a clump of them together. And if you remember, we looked at the parable of the sower and that beautiful picture of when the seed, which is the kingdom message, which is the, the word of God, is planted in a heart or in a person that is good soil, then it will be fruitful, it will multiply. And then after that, we looked at the image of the light that you put on a stand and don't hide. And that kingdom people, followers of Jesus, are light bearers in the world. And then the last week, we talked about um, the seed and the mysterious way it grows. <laughs> the sower sows the seed, and even if he's sleeping or awake, he doesn't even know, but the seed will grow. Now, the kingdom is coming. It's not fully realized in its fullness nor in each of us, but just like the mustard seed that starts small and grows and grows and grows until it becomes a place of refuge for birds and animals, becomes a place of rest. So you and I, followers of Jesus, the seed of faith, the seed of the kingdom is planted in us and it will grow <laughs> to the point where it becomes a place of rest and a message of refuge for the world around us. So Mark has given us those pictures and those images of the kingdom, and then he's gonna do a little pivoting today, and we're gonna start in on a new grouping of stories found here after for a few weeks about Jesus, not just as the teacher, not just as the parable um, teller, but as the miracle worker. Now, we have seen him do miracles in the past. He's healed the man of leprosy. He's done some work to bring healing. But this next section is really talking, um, and Mark seems to be really concerned with us understanding that the, he, these powerful acts, these miracles are connected to Jesus and his identity. So it's really important, not just that he's a mysterious good teacher, but that he is powerful. And so let's take a look at Mark chapter four. We're gonna start with verse 35. Now this is gonna be a passage that you've heard before. Um, it's really popular, um, but let's take a look at it with new eyes tonight. All right, verse 35, chapter four. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, he took him along. He, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat and it was so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. All right, let's dive in to this passage and take a look at it. Um, before we can understand what the meaning of the passage is and what it would have meant and how it would have been experienced or heard by the original 
readers, we need a little bit of context. We need some ancient Near Eastern context, we need some first century context, and we need some biblical context in terms of how this New Testament story fits into the bigger narrative of scripture. So let me just begin by saying that throughout the ancient Near East, which would have been the context of the Old Testament, water was one of those really clear symbols of chaos and disorder and darkness. It was scary. It would be fear producing. It was something that was unknown. Well, the first time we see the mention of water or deep water mentioned in the scriptures, it's in Genesis, in the creation account. And in that account, we see a couple of things. First, the, what was spoken into creation, that God breathed everything that was from nothing. So he set into motion the reality of, of the deep, of water, of the seas. So he created the seas. And then we see this image of the spirit hovering over the water in creation which is another way of saying there was authority over it, dominion and power over it, to subdue it, to be over and more powerful than that sea. So from the beginning of the narrative of scripture, from the beginning of the account of God and his people, we see this connection between the God of the universe being over, having authority over water, over the seas, over the whole natural order, in fact. So fast forward a little bit and into um, the most, arguably the most important story, account of God's activity with his people for the Israelites. And that was their rescue from slavery in Egypt. Now, if you remember the story, God had chosen a people. He'd chosen Abraham and his descendants to be his chosen nation so that he might bless them, that they might bless the whole earth. This is Genesis 12, 12. And from there, we see the story of God with his people relating to them. And he does show them favor. But here, we find in Exodus that the people of God are in misery. They are crying out to God because he has left them, it seems. They are under oppressive rule in Egypt. The Pharaoh is mistreating them, keeping them as slaves, making them work as slaves to build bricks. And the people of Israel crying out to God to deliver them. They're in misery. They're oppressed. And God hears their prayers. And it says that he is inclined towards them and he sends his messenger, in this case, Moses, to set his people free. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, asks them, asks that the people of God would be let go to worship them, worship him in the desert. And Pharaoh says, uh-uh, not so much. And talks about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, that his heart was hardened. He didn't want to do what Moses said. And despite his displays of power and his displays of authority, Pharaoh is hard-hearted and will not let the people go. And then through a series of plagues, it's 10 plagues that we find in the Old Testament, finally Pharaoh relents and tells Moses to take the people out. And they are running for their lives. There's a green light, so they go and they escape. And right on their heels, is Pharaoh and his armies. His mighty armies are chasing them down and they get to a point where they're running for their lives, running for their freedom, and they come to an obstacle that's seemingly insurmountable. And that obstacle is the Red Sea. <laughs> and behind them, they look over their shoulders and those armies of the oppressor is chasing them down and they have nowhere to go, they're stuck. And what happens? God intervenes for his people. And we see that in Exodus chapter 14, Moses stretches out his arm. And it says, 
14, 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land and the waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And over and over again, through the pages of scripture, through the stories of God's people, they recount this moment of God's activity to rescue them. It was when they crossed over the Red Sea. They went from the side of the oppressed and crossed over into freedom. They went to the other side of the sea by the mighty hand of God and his rescue. Okay, so you're reminded of that story. It was so known and so embodied and so incorporated into the narrative of the Israelites that when they, when Mark wrote this book and he wanted to capture the story of Jesus calming the storm, he starts it this way. Pay attention. He says, that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Let us go to the other side of what, you may ask. In this case, the Sea of Galilee. Let us go to the other side of the sea. Friends, they would have heard that with their Jewish ears, with their Israelite ears, and they would have connected that automatically to the story of God's rescue in Exodus. The backdrop of what we're about to experience is the reminder that God intervened and rescued his people. God is the God who's rescuing his people and setting them free. And Jesus says, let's go to the other side. So they get in the boat and it says that they took Jesus as he was. I don't know exactly what that means. Scholars talk a lot about that. Um, but they got in the boat and there were other boats with them, an interesting detail, and they take off into the sea. We don't know how long, we don't know how far they got into the water. And then it says, 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, the Sea of Galilee was an interesting geographical phenomenon. So the sea was at a low elevation and had cooler temperatures. And it was shielded by the mountains that surrounded it on, mo on two sides. And the heat from the desert would come across the, the mountain, drop down into the cool of the sea, and it would create its own weather system. In fact, even to this day, freak storms would come up on the Sea of Galilee. This was a known phenomenon. This wasn't just a one-time thing that the disciples that day would have experienced, but this would have been something that was known, probably lived through. <laughs> and especially if you were a fisherman and you fished on the Sea of Galilee, you were familiar with this weather pattern. You were familiar with the freak storms that would come across out of nowhere. So remember, Jesus is in the boat, likely owned by Peter, or Peter's father, maybe James and John's father. They were fishermen, remember? And they were in the boat, their boat, out on the lake that they fished on, experiencing what would have been normal for them. And so there they are in the boat, experiencing this storm, this squall that comes out of nowhere. But there's something different about the storm for them. It said it was a furious squall, and it, the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. <laughs> so the waves were so high that it was breaking over the boat and flooding the boat with water. An experienced fisherman would know what to do in this scenario, would get their pails out and be look, working to get the water out of the boat. And we don't know at what point they realize that not everybody's working to get them out of this mess. Not everyone's 
putting in the time and the energy to save the ship that could go down. They're missing one. And they realize that Jesus is not there. He has no pail. He's not working furiously like they are to salvage this scenario and to help them to live. And so I don't know who it was. We don't know. We don't get that detail. But it says that the disciples, it says Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him. Now, I don't imagine, friends, that was a nice little tap on the shoulder. Excuse me, Jesus? I think they were overwhelmed, anxious, fearful, distraught, and shaking him, waking him up. Because listen to what they say. They don't say, hey, do you want to give us a hand up on top? We're, we're struggling a little bit with the waves. They don't, it's not casual. It's not about the what needs to be done. They ask a really interesting question. They say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? They translate and interpret what's going on as if Jesus has no care or worry for their safety, for their life, as if he would just let them die. Don't you even care if we drown? I love this question for a few reasons. First, because the scripture, as we have them, do not capture perfect disciples. <laughs> They don't tell us that being a follower of Jesus or being a disciple means that we have perfect faith all the time. We never doubt. We're never fearful. We're never scared. We're never overwhelmed. They don't portray the disciples in a perfect light. In fact, they portray them in an honest light. That they too had doubts. They too had fears. They too were overwhelmed, even in the presence of Jesus. <laughs> and what good news that is for you and for me that to follow Jesus doesn't mean that we have to have perfect faith, but that we can come to him with our questions. Because here's the deal. I have asked God that question in a hundred different ways over the time I've been a follower of Jesus. God, don't you even care? Don't you care that I'm in pain? Don't you care that I'm worried? Don't you care that things are uncertain or unstable? Don't you care about my body? Don't you care about relationships? Don't you care that I'm lonely? Don't you care that my dad is sick? Don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you even care? <laughs> and I'm guessing that you too have had those same questions and you've asked them of Jesus. Don't you care? Because at the root of it, don't we want a God who cares? Don't we want a savior who knows and understands? And how beautiful that to follow Jesus, to follow the example of these disciples is to be able to express our truest emotions. We don't have to fix ourselves up. We don't have to get it right to pray, but we can have a conversation with him, even yelling and distraught conversation with him. He can handle it, friends. He can handle it. And what happens next in the story, it seems like he's not answering or he's avoiding their question, but I think actually what he's doing is profoundly answering it. So it says, verse 39, it says that he got up. So there's the first thing to notice. He got up. He didn't just lay there. He didn't ignore them. He didn't roll over and pretend he didn't hear them. He got up. And then it says, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. This language here, really interesting. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves. This is the same language that we see earlier in Mark when he's casting out the demons. He rebukes them. And remember I talked about how that part of it is a showdown of powers. That Jesus' proclamation of his authority over the body and over that 
evil spirit is the same thing that's happening here. He's declaring the power he has over creation. And he's saying to the waves, quiet, be still. And then they obey. It says they died down and it was completely calm. This is a funny play on words here. First, we have the storm that is described here. And it is in the Greek, mega. That's literally the word we get for mega, big, huge. It's a huge storm. And that same word is used here to classify the calm. So it starts with a huge storm, a profound storm, an overwhelming storm. And then next, when Jesus speaks and rebukes the waves and the wind, it says that it was a, it was completely calm, a huge calm, an overwhelming calm, a dramatic calm. In the midst of the storm, Jesus speaks and there is calm. And he says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now what's going on here? I don't think Jesus is saying that he's, he's not making a judgment about them having no faith at all because he does tell them earlier and later and affirms their faith in him. So what's at play here? What's happening is he's asking them a question, why are you so afraid? The word here for afraid is cowardly. Why are you basically tucking your tail and running away like a coward? That's, that's the question that he's asking. Do you still have no faith? Now, one of my favorite um, devotionals that I've read off and on for 20 something years that I've been walking with Jesus is a book by the name of My Utmost for His Highest by a guy named Oswald Chambers. You can tell it's loved because you can barely read the title. Um, and he writes about this passage on August 12th. And he says this, there are stages in life when there is no storm, no crisis, when we do our human best. It is when a crisis arises that we instantly reveal upon whom we rely. There are times, he says, in life when there's no storm or no crisis, everything seems to be okay. That's not right now in our world and in our lives. In our world, we are facing crisis upon crisis. <laughs> overwhelming crisis upon overwhelming crisis. So many of you in our community are facing personal crisis and loss, struggles, and fears, and it seems to be piling on crisis upon crisis, loss upon loss, overwhelming situation after overwhelming situation. And Oswald says that it's in these crises that we get to see that's instantly revealed upon whom we rely. You see, Jesus is calling out and shining a light on what they're relying on. You see, they were fishermen. They would have had a lot to rely on in the midst of that storm. A lot of experience, a lot of exposure, past times. They've, they know, they're trained. This is, their, this is their comfort zone out on the lake, fishing. And so they would have had a lot to rely on. But it seems like this mega storm, this huge storm, this bigger storm than they maybe they've ever seen was beyond their capacity to fix. <laughs> and so Jesus is trying to help them see who they are relying on or what they are relying on and saying, do you still not rely on me? Do you still not trust me? Do you still not believe me? Do you still not believe that I will do what I said I would do? Friends, this is the question for you and for me in the midst of our crisis. We ask God, do you care? And he is saying, this is revealing to you and to me 
what we rely on, who we rely on. In the midst of your disillusionment and fear and doubt and, and anger and all those emotions, we often want evidence of his care. And ironically, what's happening here in this passage is Jesus is trying to demonstrate the answer to their question about if he cares based on the unchanging character and the nature of who he is. Remember the Exodus? Remember that same God that rescued his people, that restored them, that took them out of their bondage into freedom. Friends, that is the same God. He was there in the Exodus and he's here in the boat and he's here in your storm and in mine. Does he care? Yes, he cares. He cared then, he cares now. He's the same God, the one that has power over creation and all the natural order. The one that saves his people from bondage. The one that stills the storms. Because you see what's happening here is, is that we had the mega storm, mega calm, and we've got one more mega in this passage. And that's mega fear. It says in verse 41, they were terrified, mega afraid, mega afraid. They were beyond themselves afraid. And they asked each other, who is this? that the wind and the waves even obey him. Because you see, the storm around them had nothing on the power of the one in the boat. They were afraid of the storm, though it legitimately would cause fear. But Jesus is saying, the safest place for you to be is near the one who's even more fear producing because of awe and wonder and power and goodness. The mega, mega fear, the terrified disciples are starting to see who Jesus is. He's unequivocally declaring, I am that God the same God in creation, the same God with the sea, the same God is with you in this boat and I have power over all creation. I am God. And just like this story ends with them asking a question, I think for us, it ends with a question. Because who they got in the boat with is a different understanding of who got through the storm with. Because who they thought Jesus was at the beginning had been transformed and they saw him in a new light. But they asked, who is this? We thought we knew, we thought we understood, we only had a glimpse, only a tidbit of who he really is. So I ask you, who is Jesus? Who is he to you? Because I believe that in the midst of whatever storm or storms are raging, and there are many, that he wants to help you see where or who or what you rely on. That's a small thing compared to the great God. And he wants you to see who he is, to be revealed as the God who saves and rescues and redeems because he's in that boat with them and he can calm the storm because he does care. He cares more than you and I can ever imagine.